the Thoughty or Tea podcast. What can that miscommunication look like and, and why does it happen? Oh my gosh, for so many reasons, Thomas, right? So the first... There's a lot I of will... things, yeah. Got like a list of <laughs> right. things to go through. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll tell you some of the big ones from my marriage and that I didn't understand. So first of all, I am extremely emotional. So whenever I cried, or whenever I shared more than one thing with my ex, I flooded him. And the flooding led to a shutdown on his part. So what I learned in my next relationships is to bring up one topic or issue at a time. If I could prepare my partner ahead of time, because of course I have a type and now I pretty much date, you know, mostly autistic men. And or neurodivergent <laughs> men. Right? I know, so, I know so, someone else like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's something that I'm really really attracted to about a lot of neurodivergent men. They're they're amazing. So the flooding piece, knowing that sometimes what I needed to do was send a text or an email and say these are some of the things that are really affecting me right now, or that I'd like to talk to you about. When would be a good time? Because I did that after we divorced and the conversations we had after that were so different than the conversations we had in our marriage. Because number one, it gave him time to really think about how to address those issues. I wasn't super emotional and flooding him because I had time to think about what I wanted to say and I could be more concise and specific, which I learned I am, or I wasn't in my marriage concise or specific at all, right? So those are important. And then those are really, really big things. The flooding, being emotional, not being concise and specific, and giving your partner the space and the time to really think through the topics that you want to talk about. I think that's really, sure. really critical. I suppose there's like there's some some aspects to that that I could probably tease out a little bit. I think go for it. I think that yeah. I think there's there's um there's definitely in terms of that kind of prepping people before before having like a very serious or perhaps negative or, or controversial got con- controversial. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Just a con- controversy. No, what am I saying? My my brain is very foggy today. You'll have to be That's very okay. um, understanding about it. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> yes. So a confrontation. That's what I'm a trying to go for. Confrontational. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think there's uh, there's definitely an aspect of you know we, we talk a lot about transitions, and I think even in terms of social socializing, um, understanding like. Or, or having time to to ease into a social transition is quite important for 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 me and I think for a lot of people. I think when, you know, I'm looking back at, at times in my life where, you know, someone's been upset about something and they've kind of just come at me with this, as you said, kind of like a, a flood a flood of emotions. It's it's very overwhelming because I'm not I'm not in the headspace where I'm like, okay, right, we're talking about something. And also, as you said, you know, having time to think about things, it's really important when you when you are quite alexithymic and you you struggle to identify and understand um your own emotions in in the moment specifically. So having some time to really like understand how you feel about certain things and what you want to say, I think can can be really important. I think as well, it can sometimes be a bit anxiety provoking when someone's like, oh, right, we're going to talk about this at some point. But I think in every single case that someone has done that with me, it's, it tends to be a lot more easy. You know, I, I think, I think there's probably another element to miscommunication that might come more from the, the autistic side of things, which can be things around like, like PDA, pathological demand avoidance, which you know, it's it's very apparent when we're younger, but when we get into adulthood, it's it's a it's a little bit different. And whenever there is kind of expectations put on us to to speak, or or we're 
you know, thinking about some expectations that someone's going to have for us in a relationship, it can often be quite uh, difficult not to kind of shut down and stuff um, in those kind of situations. Like it's kind of like a, a defense mechanism sometimes mm-hmm. when yeah. when someone is, you know, saying, right, this is what I need from you. And, you know, the expectations are like a very core part of why PDA is, occurs when we have someone who puts expectations on us. Um, that's that's the main thing. It's not about being difficult or being like aggressive or, or single minded or anything. It's, there is a motorbike gone by. It can be very noisy up this road. <laughs> it's okay. But I, th- I think that that's also another thing. And I feel like the, the situations where I've had the most productive co- conversations, which do kind of touch on perhaps negative things, is when there is kind of an air of slow pacing to the conversation or, you know, Totally. Absolutely. And I was guilty of telling off. I was guilty of rushing conversations. I was guilty of not understanding my ex's need for transitions. I mean, all the things that you said, also the issue of intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic motivation, say that three times fast. So I didn't understand that my ex, when he came home from work, what he needed was time alone to decompress. And that might be in front of a computer. It might be in front of a TV. It might be sitting alone at the dinner table, eating his dinner by himself. And the thing is, Thomas, I took that personally. So if, if I had understood that those were things he needed, in order for us to have a conversation, we could have avoided so much miscommunication, right? So if you know that you are in a neurodiverse relationship and you know that one or both of you is autistic or neurodivergent, I think one of the most important things is to understand what your needs are and what you want in a relationship, and to be able to communicate that with kindness and compassion with your partner, rather than doing it, which this is the way I did it often, I didn't know we were a neurodiverse couple, I was a screamer, you know, I grew up in a house where we screamed, and that's how I got my ex-husband's attention, oh my gosh, I can't imagine the dysregulation in his nervous system. Every time I opened my mouth, he didn't know if I was going to scream, if I was going to speak to him with kindness, love, and compassion. I can't even imagine how that must have felt to him. So I think that miscommunication comes a lot of times from not understanding what each partner needs. Because if you can communicate that to your partner, then if they care about you, especially if they love you, they're going to want to do that. But they're thinking you yeah. need what they need. And you may be thinking that the same thing, vice versa. They, but they you've never what, talked what you, about what you need. Yeah. Right. You've, you've made assumptions yeah. and you know what happens when we make assumptions, right? Hmm. <laughs> if hmm. you assume you make an ass out of you and me, which isn't good, right? So. Well, we're all kind of the centers of our own universe, aren't we? So we all kind of believe that, oh, I'm experiencing this, I'm a human. So it should be the exact same for every single person. Like, And it isn't. And it isn't. Right. It's not. Uh, so the other thing that, you know, I was not aware of was sensory sensitivities, right? So if we mm-hmm. were in a place where there was a lot of extraneous noise, I remember my ex telling me that he could not necessarily hear me or he could not necessarily hear a conversation because he was focused on all of the noise around us. And as he got older, I think it got worse for him. And I couldn't understand that. I'm like, I'm sitting right next to you. Why can't you hear me? Right. Again, judgment, not a compassionate kind of curious mind. I didn't know about you know, our neurological differences. I think it's it's interesting, isn't it, with the the sensory things? Because I, I came across a, a concept. I think I was talking to someone about it on a on a podcast. I think it was uh Happy Autistic Lady where we were talking about 
concept called habituation, which mm-hmm. is basically like it's best described in terms like someone came up with like the analogy of the snail about um habituation. It's like if you were to boop a snail, you know, usually it would kind of it would go into its shell. And if it came back out and you booped it again, it would go back in its shell. Right. Came back out, you booped it again, it would be like, hmm. Maybe I shouldn't go back in my shell. It's not, you know, it's not a, not a not a threat. And that that's hip, kind of the idea of habituation, whereby things that occur very very regularly and consistently, your brain kind of tunes them out as as things. So if if you were to translate that to perhaps the the sensory environments, like um, going to a bar or being in a in a in in public in town where there's lots of busy busy stuff going on, lots of people, lots of noises. Most people, they might be able to, well, they, they, they are able to kind of tune that out to some extent, whereby it kind of, it's kind of like isolating a voice, you know, where, when someone's talking to you. But when you, you're autistic or when you have sensory differences, sometimes it's, a lot of the time, it can be quite hard to tune that stuff out and actually focus on someone that that's speaking to you you know it's it's like your brain's being it's like a roundabout and there's loads of traffic coming in from from different parts of the roundabout mm-hmm. uh, rather than just one car going round and you know processing mm-hmm. like you would do if you were having a conversation somewhere quite quiet yeah and it can be overwhelming but i didn't know that you know i also sure discovered that when I used a certain tone to my voice, it literally Hmm. caused pain for my ex-husband. And he got special ear earbuds that were fitted just for his ears so that he wouldn't hear the things that were, you know, painful to him. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's you know like the is that something to do with volume or is that like the pitch or is the that pitch, like? I think it was the pitch and hmm. the volume. So imagine, you know, I took these things personal, you know, I took so much personally. And I think that happens in, in every relationship. But I think in a neurodiverse relationship, if you understand the underlying reason for the things you're taking personally, you can give your partner grace and hopefully you can accept the differences. But, you know, we didn't know. So can you imagine every time I sat next to him or stood next to him, and I think it was on his right side, he would move because my voice, the pitch of my voice, and maybe even how loud I was, um, hurt his ear. And at first he told me, but then he would just change location. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know, trying to be kind, but I didn't take it that way. So I think I think, yeah, and then that you get that those nonverbal cues. You're like, oh, they're yeah. moving away when I sit down next to them. Mm, yes. What are they trying to say, or what are they trying yes. to insinuate? I'm like, <laughs> yes, yes. Instead of asking, you know, what what can we both do? Do I need to walk mm. on this side when we're together? Do I need to talk to you in that ear because I didn't really understand the pain and the sensory issues? Yeah, and I think. You know, there, there are so many miscommunications between neurodiverse couples because we don't necessarily understand ourselves, right? Whether we're the holistic sure. partner or the autistic partner. And I think the other thing that I realized is my ex probably was masking for the entire time we were together mm-hmm. because he would say to me that he was going to do things. And then not follow through. And I think a lot of times it was because he wanted to meet my needs or expectations. Never, I don't think he ever wanted to disappoint me. Or for himself, for himself, not not to feel like he can't do things and exactly those neurotypical expectations and exactly. And then when he didn't follow through, and I became the nag, or I became kind of annoying again, or judgmental. It caused conflict. And so there was another miscommunication. If he wanted to do it, but he wasn't sure if he was going to be able to, 
I needed to create kind of emotional safety in our relationship, which I don't think that I did on a regular basis, so that he could say, I'm not sure I can do that, but I'm going to try. And this is what I can do right now. This is what I can commit to right now. Or I can't say yes. And I had to be okay with a no. And Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times I wasn't okay with the no, because then I didn't understand where the no came from. Because I didn't that understand just kind of why felt he felt like just being difficult for the for the sake yes. of it, and, or yeah. why he could do something yesterday, but he couldn't do it a week later. The same task or request would be denied, and it might be because sure. he was too overloaded, right? And I didn't know, and he didn't understand why he couldn't always be consistent in something that could be very simple, you know, like coming home at a certain time from work. So now I understand all those things, but it caused so many problems and miscommunication. I think, you know, there there definitely is a kind of a a glaring thing for me in terms of miscommunication, particularly between autistic and holistic individuals is the, um, the indirect versus indirect, indirect versus direct communication, you know, I've had a lot of situations where I have taken someone's words like very um, directly. Like it's, we, we tend, a lot of us tend to put a lot of weight on what people say to us. Like the actual words, like it's kind of, best way to describe it is kind of like we take it as it would be written in a book or written in a piece of text right. rather than the, the the different aspects of the tone and the delivery and the emotions and the facial expressions and the body language that accompany that, which, you know, a lot of holistic individuals may 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 use a lot of. Mm-hmm. And then we on do. the flip side, a lot of direct communication that we use um is kind kinda of goes unheard because the level of like emotional or, or tonality changes uh, doesn't doesn't indicate that it's necessarily as important as we are saying it. Yep. Like uh, I think <laughs> this is a really good example about you know if if you go up to someone and say in the in in this kind of tone you know I'm I'm feeling ninety percent of my capacity at the moment I'm very anxious and I'm going to have a meltdown. And you say it like that and they kind of just like oh. That that's yeah. Do, do you need any help with that? And it's like, <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, and it, it's it's communicated in a way that I'm like, I'm being very clear about what exactly is happening, but nobody's reacting in the, in that way. Whereas if I was to go, oh my god, I'm so stressed, like yeah, I'm so anxious, and I just uh, you, my brain is all over the place, and I just I can't do all of this, and. Yeah, people are like, oh my god, okay, okay, let's get let's get you somewhere else, let's get you quiet. Like there's I think from both sides it can it can often feel like neither one is really getting across what they're wanting to get across because the the holistic individual isn't taking the direct communication as seriously as they should. And mm-hmm. the autistic person is perhaps not picking up on, on exactly what the indirect communication means. Um, in terms of what they say, like it's, it, I think it is a really, really big thing that, you know, even, even in relationships that I've had, it's something that people forget about, you know, it's, um, it's, you know, that they'll forget that you don't necessarily always, um, have that level of expression as well. You know, I, I, I talk a lot about, uh, emotional expression versus emotional explanations, you know, Emotional explanation being explaining, describing feelings, saying that I'm feeling this way because of this and it makes me feel like this. And it's very serious or it's it's not too bad. Um, whereas emotional expression is is the way that you deliver it. There's kind of extra indirect aspects to to how we're saying things. I love that, Thomas. I absolutely love that. And in the neurodiverse couples support groups that I facilitate, one of the things that I suggest to couples is 
to use either red, uh, yellow, and green like cards or just the words. Like mm. I'm at a red, which means I'm like at yeah. a 10. I'm going to explode. I cannot talk to you. And just to be able to either use a card or say the word, right? A yellow, mm. you might be able to talk about one non-emotional, you know, not a deep subject for a short amount of time. And then green, I'm good to go. You know, I have enough mm -hmm. spoons, I have enough energy or whatever. But I think when we're dysregulated, I think this goes for any couple, but I think it's really challenging in a neurodiverse relationship. When I have a pressing issue that I want to talk to my husband or my partner about, and they're at red, which could, you could use yeah. numbers if that's easier for you. And maybe they're mm -hmm. at a 10 or a minus 10. Percentages. Whatever, right. Yeah, percentages. Percent, whatever oh, yeah. Yeah. When your partner shares that with you, you need to respect their boundaries because that's a boundary. That is, if you go into a conversation with me when I'm in this place, you are no longer respecting my boundaries and I will either explode and melt down possibly, um, or I'm going to shut down and it could be for days, right? And I would, I would notice that for, for me and my ex-husband, he would shut down. And sometimes yeah. I wouldn't really hear from him for days. And then he'd come back to me after he had processed and he had done what he needed to do to decompress. And sometimes he would literally use the exact words that I had said to him when I had overwhelmed him, right? When he was at a 10. So he might have heard what I said but he wasn't able to process it until he was able to process it. So sure, finding sure. the tools that you can use with your partner when either one of you are at a 10 or are about to explode versus at, you know, green or a one, then you can be able to communicate and hear each other because you can listen, Indeed. but mm. you may not hear each other. I think it's, um, it's it's really apt saying that. I mean that there is like the I'm using apt a lot. I don't I, I don't exactly know. I just like it's I, I go through a list of words. I'm like, hmm, this <laughs> this word kind of works for me. This this month I'll use apt a lot. That sounds good. Okay. I think it it's you know, you you're definitely highlighting um an aspect that's very important that I think is often a an issue for holistic autistic relationships. Uh, and that's that's the social battery, and I don't think that a lot of partners of autistic people are really aware of perhaps how much of their social battery that being around someone for like a day or like a weekend ca can actually eat up like our social battery, and and we get told like, why don't you go out? Why don't you go and see friends? And we're like, well, I just don't. I just don't feel able or, you know, I don't feel in the right headspace to go out. And quite often it's just because, you know, we spent the battery, you know, it's, 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 it's gone. And, and I think that's, you know, even looking, looking at it in a, in a wider scale, you know, sometimes, you know, for me, my, my ideal situation in, in a relationship is that I, I see my partner like three days a week, whereas like the other the other days I'm kind of on my own doing my own thing. And that, that seems to be a good balance for me. But, you know, as, as uh, we will talk about kind of like the milestones and stuff and sort of managing daily life. But I think having an appreciation for just how like quickly that social battery can be drained, even just within the company of another person is, is quite important, you know, cause we, you need to maintain your friendships because you know, if the relationship breaks down, then you don't have people to rely on that you've talked to. You've not you're not maintaining those those really close connections, which are quite important. And you you're always feeling like you're not doing enough. You're not engaging enough with them. You're not seeing them enough. And so there's always the kind of that pressure that you're like, all right, I need to talk to them now. I need to talk to them at this point, and I have to plan in th this amount. And it it does start to. I think when someone's very adamant that that you see them a lot more, it can really just 
you know, break down a lot of areas of, of your life, even if it's stuff like work or let alone friendships. And there's, I think, I think as well, it's, it is important, particularly when that person is not, not in a good place. And, you know, as you said, you really want to talk to them about something. I can draw on personal experiences that I've had recently. You know, my, my then partner kind of, I don't know, they, uh, they, they really wanted me to, to talk to me. And it's something that that's, that's happened maybe quite a few times and I haven't been in the right headspace. I've needed one, two, three days just to kind of process and, and think about it. And it was, um, in this situation, they, they rushed it. Like they were like calling me multiple times and I was like, like, I, I really just can't talk, you know, trying to put my boundaries in place. And it wasn't something that, 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 that person was. I guess understanding about like they took it, took it as me just being difficult. And I think that, that that's kind of a common thread. I think when people don't, I'm, I'm raising my hand. Understand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did that it's like, oh, you're just, well, you're trying to play this weird power move on me. And I'm like, no, like it's not, it's not that it's, I just literally like, if you want me to process what you're saying and you want to talk about it, I need to be in a good place. And, you know, I think, you know, there, there is something that I, I could probably touch on, which is sort of related to that, which we could talk about in a, in a different question. Do you think that there's, there's any other kind of common mis miscommunications that, that can happen? Yeah, I think the emotional piece is really, really critical in a lot of the neurodiverse couples mm. because what you talked about with not showing a lot of emotion when you are at mm, your wits that end, flat affects the that vocal flat affect. yeah. yeah. And like, you know, one of the reasons that I actually moved forward on filing for divorce was because I was in the emergency room. I thought I was having a heart attack. My ex and I were separated. He walked in and he didn't say hello. He didn't ask me how I was doing. He didn't, you know, hold my hand. He didn't give me a hug, nothing. And then a few minutes later, he screamed at me that he was going to divorce me the next week. Now I know Thomas. That's not, well, that's not very like. <laughs> but he was overwhelmed. That seems like very poor timing. <laughs> right. But he was overwhelmed. He'd never seen me so vulnerable, right? He'd never seen me in a situation like that. You know, we'd been together 32 years mm. and I might have woken him up out of sound sleep. So I was looking mm. for that emotional connection and I was looking for that support because I was scared to death. But I can't tell you how sure. many couples have shared that a similar type thing happened, like a, a dog died or a um, parent died or a sibling got diagnosed with a horrible disease like cancer. And then they've shared that with their neurodivergent partner. And there was not the response they were looking for. And I think a lot mm. of times, again, misunderstanding that the partner may not know exactly what to say. Because that particular experience has never happened to them before. They don't want to say the sure. wrong thing, right? They, and so I think for those of us that aren't autistic, when we're having those crises, we need to be able to say to our partner, what I need from you right now is for you to hold my hand. What I need from you sure. right now is for you to sit here and sit next to me and just hold me while I cry. And I know sometimes mm. that's hard mm. to do when you're emotional, but if my partner doesn't feel emotions the way I do or doesn't process them the way I do, I'm going to see him as bad for that. I'm going to judge him when Cold. really he may be kind of scared and he doesn't know what to do. And I think that's what happened over and over again in my marriage. So I literally had to say to my ex, when I'm crying, when I'm upset, the best thing that you can do is walk over to me and give me a hug. And so 
I know for some people, it feels uncomfortable to ask for the emotional reciprocity or the emotional response you want. But if you it's don't ask for isn't it, it, right? If you don't ask for it, there's no way for your partner to know. And I suppose in kind of looking at what we said earlier, or thinking about what we said earlier about, you know, you kind of being the center of the universe and you kind of thinking everyone works the same way that you do. Like, I don't, am I right in thinking that if they've been in that state, that that's not something that they would want? Like, they might want some a bit more distance and time to, right. like, right. think about it. and Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Because when my ex-husband's mother died, he cried for a few seconds, and then that was it. Mm. And when his father died, sure. he didn't cry at all. Where mm. I was an absolute mess when my parents died. And I, Thomas, I didn't understand his reaction. I didn't understand his response. I thought he was cold. I thought he was stoic. I thought he was uncaring. And what I realize now is, oh my gosh, he was probably feeling so much inside, but he didn't know what he needed in the moment or how to express his emotions. And, and I can't remember exactly what happened, but he probably spent a lot of time alone kind of processing his feelings. Sure. And I wanted him to talk to me. I wanted him to connect. Another miscommunication, right? I took it personal. I thought things about him that weren't true. You know, I saw him mm -hmm. through a negative lens. And I share all this and I try to be vulnerable and realize what I did wrong as well as what we did wrong as a couple, because there are so many couples out there that are unintentionally hurting each other. And it has to stop. It has to stop because it's ending relationships. It's causing people to be physically and mentally not healthy and emotionally not healthy. And so that's why I say understanding what your needs are and what you want in a relationship and being clear about what boundaries you need, it can be a game changer in a relationship. But you got to understand each partner has to understand themselves and feel like they can communicate that to their partner and that their partner is not going to judge them, right? So, I yeah, think for having different needs. I think it's 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 definitely something like I'm just kind of thinking about myself in in those kind of situations. I had a podcast with Autism from the Inside, uh, Paul, Paul McCallif, I love Paul. which I think awesome. I think you know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we we were talking about that, and he brought up like a very sort of aspect of Alexa Fiamia, which I resonated with a lot, and and that's kind of being good in emergency situations, but not not necessarily with the emotional component of it. It's like when we're when we're in an emergency situation, we're very helpful in terms of logic. How do we get over this? What you need to do, you know, grounding people, but perhaps not not the immediate emotional responses that that a lot of people might have. And and also, I think that there is an aspect of, like specifically for myself, when someone's telling me something that's that's fairly emotional and and raw or open or you know, vulnerable, I feel that I don't engage as much. Like I, my, my way of respecting or understanding is that is by processing it very, 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 very heavily. I don't, you know, I look off into the distance. I kind of focus in on exactly what they're saying and try to think about what it means for them, what it, what I would feel in that situation. And while I'm doing all of that, I'm just kind of bit more stone face and I'm just kind of like looking off into the distance and it's you know I'm feeling those emotions very very intensely and I'm like oh my god like but it but it doesn't necessarily appear that way on the outside it could just look like I'm not really listening and I'm just kind of not not contributing not trying to help them and you know so it's it's and and it's the same with a lot of autistic people that that I've met it's like you know they when they're expressing something, they 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 just speak about it, and they they just they don't necessarily have that aspect of 
getting getting upset or getting emotional, they may get emotional upset later on when they kind of process those emotions and what those events mean to them. But in the moment, it's very much like this, right? I'm a, I'm a sponge and I'm just absorbing what's happening, what they're saying and, and how they're feeling. So I feel like sometimes that can be miscommunicated. Absolutely. You know, when, when Usually when people like think of people who are really listening to them, they make eye contacts much more than <laughs> usual and they make the faces and they're like right. asking questions and they're, right. they're saying, yeah, yeah, I get you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stuff like that. All, st all stuff that stops you from processing exactly what that person's saying for especially right. for an autistic person right when you're trying right. to focus too much on that indirect communication you're not right. really sitting with what people are saying so it's it's interesting that kind of yeah that kind of dynamic you know and it's a major miscommunication it's a major it, it might be one of the most serious ones because when I'm looking for mm. that emotional reciprocity and I'm looking for you to shake your head and I'm looking for you to go, uh huh, I, I hear you, I understand, or I, I hear that must have been difficult and I'm looking for validation and I'm looking for some feedback mm. and you're not giving it to me and I don't know you're autistic or I don't know you're neurodivergent or I know nothing about neurodiversity. I'm judging you. Yeah. And I know, yeah. you know, your listeners like how, are going to... How gonna, could you not? Right. You're gonna, can you not gonna feel hear? anything? How could you not <laughs> right. d d d ex validate what I'm saying? And Exactly. <laughs> so, so here's one of the things that I say to couples. I say, when you're having a conversation with each other and you know what you need from your partner, ask for it. So if you need validation, you can say, I'm going to share what happened at work. And I need your validation, meaning I need you to say, I understand. That sounds like it was really hard for you. And you can even come up with a few sentences that can be used, you know, repeatedly. Or I just need you to listen. And I just need you to hold my hand and snuggle with me while I talk, <laughs> you know, while mm. I word vomit, right? Um, or yeah. I, I need you to help me come up with a solution because your sure. brain works differently than mine. And when you can ask for what you need while you're having that conversation, then you set your partner up for success. I didn't do that. So every conversation we had, you know, I might be looking for different things, but I wasn't clear and concise about what I needed and wanted because I don't even know mm. if I knew half the time. Right. So I that think, I think definitely like the snuggling, the, the snuggling and the hand holding and the kind of, aspects where you don't have to like look at each other and you can just kind of get that that validation through touch is also i think something something that works quite quite well because you don't necessarily have to think about all those indirect things you can just kind of sit there and listen and comfort your partner with with touch and you know that i think that's that's a very important part um, yeah. of that yeah I agree with that. Definitely. Yeah. And, and the emergency response piece, Thomas, I'm a hundred percent in agreement with you. I think a lot of mm. folks who are like first responders in law enforcement, in the military. I know, I know many of them. Fit, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a perfect yeah, I, fit. Yeah. To some because, degree. I think the, some of the sensory and social oh, components yeah. can be like, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it'll be interesting to do a study. What is like the paramedic and like the first responders kind of yeah. statistics on autism? Because that, yeah. that could be something that you It'd know, I, I definitely see myself in that situation. If I see someone hurt or is it, I see someone not in a good place, I'm always like, damn, like I'm going for it and Yeah. It's a very and my weird ex description, was the same way. But... Yeah, like we would see somebody who was hurt or an accident and he would stop and, and possibly see if there's anything we could do or whatever. I would be like, Assess keep going, the situation. keep going. I don't want to see yeah. anything. I don't want to see any blood or gore or dead people. Keep going. I can't do this. Because I would get overwhelming like anxiety from seeing people hurt. I could not. I, I felt too much. Yeah. He was able to kind of remove himself from it and just act in the emergency situation in the best way possible. Unless it was me, 
he could do it with our daughter, but he, he didn't do it well with me. Yeah. So it's interesting. I think that, that the last thing that I would really like to talk about, which is, I think I would probably say one of one of another one of the biggest ones is cog stuff to do with cognitive empathy. And I've talked about this before, and there's been a lot of autistic people who've come back to me and say, Oh, I I understand these situations. Don't tell me that I don't understand these these this as aspects. But it is it's very well researched and a lot of autistic people do tend to lack this aspect of cognitive empathy in the context of an holistic individual. You know, in the context of autism, it's not an issue because you don't need to have that aspect of it because it's sort of, you know, it's understood anyway. But in terms of like picking up on signals that you're tr indirect signals that you're trying to drop to them or certain behavioral differences that you do in order to communicate how you're feeling, anything that's not explicitly characterizable as an emotion. Like if you're crying, obviously we know that you're upset. If you're be becoming quiet and you're not, you, you're giving shorter sentences and you know, you kind of have a bit more of a lower vocal tonality, we may be able to say, you know, what's, what's happening. Like you, you're acting differently, but a lot of people, when you do that, they say they're okay. And they're like, oh, okay, direct communication. You must be okay then, great. You know, and so you have that situation where I think there's there's a concept that I'm not totally on board with it, but like the idea of like the, the Cassandra syndrome that's talked about a lot, you know, that feeling unemotion unemotionally heard by by your partner and people not really believing you that you they're like that. I don't think that that's necessarily right because it's it's a lot to do with that those that miscommunication. You know, on one side, you know, if the if the autistic person is really hyper aware of that, they will be asking you all the time if there's any differences to the communication that that the indirect communication that seems to be coming across. And <laughs> on on the other side, the person will feel like, oh, hey, actually, they don't care about how I feel. And they don't pick up on this stuff and they're just kind of brushing it off, even though I'm making it obvious to them. No, they're not. You, if you communicate directly, that's always going to cancel out that feeling of, you know, what's up because of the, the indirect stuff. So you get, get a lot of situations where people are like, oh, they don't care about me. They don't care, care about me in, in these ways. And I say, you know, have you told them that you're feeling a certain way? No, no, I haven't. <laughs> they should just read my they, mind. They, 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 <laughs> <laughs> but I, th yeah. I think that's something that even a lot of just neurotypical relationships struggle yes. with to a yes. certain degree. It's just a lot more heightened. And it's it's kind of like if, if you have situations where that person is trying to in com communicate indirectly, very subtly over a long period of time, it comes to a breaking point where they're like, why don't you care about me? And all this emotion just comes out and you're like, what, 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 what is happening? Like, I didn't know you were not feeling okay. <laughs> like, right. You know, so right. you have that kind of reactivity, um, just, just off the block. And it kind of, it feels like it just comes out of nowhere at all. Just, it just comes out of nowhere. And it's very, it's very frightening. Some, sometimes just, just like for us, you know, feeling like at any moment a partner could just tell us that, you know, we're, we're not being a good partner and that we we're not caring about our feelings. And, and we're like, I can't remember a time when I when I didn't. You didn't say that you were feeling that way, and they're like, well, I didn't need to say that I didn't. You should have picked it up, like, you know. So you have situations like that. Yeah, were you a fly on the wall of my marriage for thirty years? That's exactly what happened. <laughs> That's exactly what happened, Thomas. And you know, so the Cassandra syndrome was um, coined by Maxine Aston, and I think that if we kind of take it apart, like we peel the onion a little bit, I think it's about hmm. misunderstanding. 
I think it's about miscommunication. Sure. I think it's about not being clear what we each want and need. I think it's about having different perspectives and not respecting each other's perspectives. I think it's about so many things that we didn't understand when Cassandra syndrome was coined as a term. It's a right? very pathologizing thing that's a very medical model kind of autism is the problem. Yeah. And yeah. looking on my relationships and looking <laughs> talking to other people, they feel the exact same thing. Like they, they don't feel like what they're communicating is being heard um, because it's not, you know, there's indirect aspects to it and the other person doesn't understand. So I, I would agree with you there. Yeah. The miscommunication is like the definitely the core of that kind of thing. Yeah. And the double empathy piece, right? Because there oh, are yeah. so many couples that um, don't have empathy for each other's way of doing things or way of communicating. And so there's that constant judgment. I mean, that's what happened over and over again in my marriage. And thank goodness that I learned about neurodiversity because I would have kept making the same mistakes in every relationship thereafter, right? If you don't know better, how can you do better, right? So now, sure. Sure. you know, I ask when we have an emotional issue that we need to talk about or something that's pretty deep. And it's going to take more than a five minute conversation. What is the best way for me to approach you so that we can have that conversation when we're both in a good place? I would have never done that in my marriage ever. You know, um, another area that we didn't talk about is like vacations. I know a lot of the vacations that we went on. Oh my gosh. There were lots of arguments and fights and anger, right? Because I didn't That's understand. The routine. I didn't understand the, the overload, changes. right? I didn't understand the routine change, new places, ru changes in change. routine, new places, <laughs> new beds, new bathroom, new everything. And and again, I don't think my ex understood what he needed. And oftentimes mm. he would end up sleeping till two, three, four o'clock in the afternoon on vacation. I'm like, I've already been out for six hours and you're still in bed, <laughs> right? So yeah. here's another... Yeah place where we had repeated conflict and here you are spending money thomas you're going on vacation thinking you're going to be able to wind down and enjoy yourselves and then because you don't understand each other's needs there's conflict and judgment right well they, just, they need that kind of time to adjust to the the new environment and to feel right. comfortable when right 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 and even like sitting on a plane for hours and not being able to get up and walk out, mm. you know, and have your own quiet time. And what if there are, are kids or babies crying on the plane or there's turbulence? You know, all those things that we don't take into consideration mm. can be really challenging. Mm. So I, I think the Cassandra syndrome is something that a lot of folks feel comfortable talking about if they're the holistic or neurotypical partner, but I don't think the double empathy piece is something that enough people are talking about, right? Yes. And I think it's critical. For any relationships, you need that sense of compromise. And that that's the same with that's yeah, I think that's even more important in neurodiverse relationships. Like you, the, there are so many things that you can bring when you to the relationship when you're of a different neurotype, different perspectives, different ways of viewing things and tackling problems that are in, in their lives. And uh, you know, obviously there, there are those 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 things that need to need to be understood first and also to be communicated about, talked about, you know, managed in interpersonally over a long period of time. It's, you know, it's not like you say it once and it's completely embedded for the rest of the time. And, you know, there's been a lot of circumstances where people have understood, you know, that I make a lot of content about autism and people kind of understood that, you know, I, I work this way and this is just how I am and I'm not going to magically change and switch. And, you know, there's some things that you need to meet me on. And that, and I understand there's some some ways that I need to meet you on as well, mm -hmm. and and not necessarily, you know, it's it's it is a compromise. I mean, with any yeah. relationship, it's kind of like a 
it's it's somewhat of a loose idea of a contract in certain circumstances yeah. you know you are getting something from the other person you are giving something to that person as well yeah it's a bit businessy I, I to agree. think of it like that but i think it's definitely worth highlighting yeah because imagine if you got into a relationship and you could be honest about these are the five things that i want you to know about me right that are really critical right? Maybe something regarding the emotional piece, maybe something regarding the sensory piece, maybe something regarding, you know, taking trips and transitions and change, uh, maybe something regarding how you process and communicate or like to communicate. You know, what if you could share those things after the first date? Don't share them on the first date, right? <laughs> I don't want to spill yeah, all yeah. all this information on the first date because you might scare somebody away. But maybe like the third. So you or need the to fourth. do this, this, and this, and here's the form, and here's an integration <laughs> pamphlet. <laughs> You're going to have to read all and memorize all of these. And yes, <laughs> and sign on the dotted line if you want a second date, right? Yeah, but yeah, but imagine yeah. if you knew those things about yourself and you could communicate them in a kind, compassionate way to your potential partner, right? So that's one of the reasons I created understand. the neurodiverse mm -hmm. love conversation cards. And I don't remember if I sent them. I, I think I sent them. them. Yeah. Okay. You did send so, them. Yeah. I really so like them. those are 52 questions. I wish my ex-husband and I had asked each other early on in our relationship, because if we had understood how the other needed or processed all those topics, oh my gosh, we would have avoided so much conflict and so much judgment, so much. And, and I think we don't even know the right questions to ask each other oftentimes, you know? Sure, sure. What do you need when you're transitioning from work to home? I wouldn't mm -hmm. think to ask that of my ex-husband, but time, now I please. would. I'm An sorry. hour or two to decompress and then, right. then we can chat. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, But it's not that kind of romanticized mainstream idea of how relationships would run. It's like, oh, your husband returns from a day of work and you're like, oh, great. Hi, honey, here's it. the dinner's already. Sit down, right. let's have a conversation and, right. and have a meal and and, right. and all of this stuff. And then let's do this and that. And it's like, oh my God, Jesus, right. that's a lot to do right. after you've burnt yourself out from a day of work. <laughs> right. And imagine if neurodiverse couples understood that at the beginning of their relationship. Hmm. Right. And Thomas, you're a lot younger than me, right? I'm 59. You're my daughter's age. And so your generation is coming into the dating world, knowing so much yeah. about neurodiversity, which we didn't when I was dating. My ex and I, we started dating at 21. We married at 23. There was no such diagnosis as autism spectrum disorder. Autism was something that you saw in children, right? And there were other diagnoses for adults. I mean, it, it could be even schizophrenia, you know? There was anxiety and depression and all these other things that we didn't know autism in adults. And now your generation and the generations that come after you have this knowledge and you can have these conversations with your partner and you can say, I want to understand how your brain is wired. I wonder, want to understand what makes you work well in a relationship. Yeah. I would have I, never I said think that. You, you definitely, you, you're definitely right on, on that part. There is the knowledge out there. I just, I wish that it was more of a mainstream conversation because yeah, I agree. That's where that's the relationships that people need that in. If some someone's already part of the autistic community, they can they can talk to their partner about these things. It's not everyone though, and it's probably not 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 might not even be a majority of autistic people who have that. And then talking about relationships and dating, that's also very niche within a niche of you know the autistic community. So it definitely it's there. I just wish that it was more accessible to people because you know i get a lot of people who, who come on to like my lives so or they send me messages and they're like hey this this happened it really helped me understand my partner and we've had conversations about it. and it's like good that is that is brilliant but not a lot of people you know would would perhaps search for things like that 
and 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 find stuff around that and and perhaps they don't even know that they're diagnosed or not i would also I say that there are additional issues with dating nowadays which i think probably would make the the whole, the process very very complex and difficult you can imagine situations where people are kind of have this this phone and they can swipe and they can find people and if something minute happens in the relationship they're like oh this is like a power thing and i'm gonna be independent i'm gonna push them away and i'm you know they're not we're not gonna talk it over and and develop things further and and communicate about it it's done it's done i'm, I'm not having it i'm gonna go find another one and it's gonna be easy <laughs> yeah <laughs> I totally so, can relate. I, I actually did an episode on, I think, I think we called it something like, am I dating somebody who's autistic or on the spectrum? And I think that, remember, I'm 59, right? So a lot mm -hmm. of the men that are on the dating apps, what's interesting is they're in IT, they're engineers, they're in finance. Mm. And many of them, when you go out on a date with them, you talk to them. This is a generalization. So I hope your, your listeners will, will, will see it as that. I'm just, I'm just putting this out there. Many of them sure. ended their relationship or multiple relationships. And oftentimes it's marriages. I can't tell you how many men I've gone out with or talked to who've been in two or three marriages. Remember, they're my age or older. And they're trying mm. to figure out how to get this right. They do not know yeah. that they're neurodivergent. They do not know that they're autistic. But when I tell them that I have a podcast called Neurodiverse Love, they're like, what is that about? And I tell them. Yeah, they and don't even know what neurodiverse them. means. So. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them are like, and I have to explain what neurodiverse means. And I can't tell you. I probably had a half a dozen men listen to the podcast and say, I think I'm autistic. Yeah. So I'm like, and these are men in their fifties and sixties. I think so I, that is a, I think it's really <laughs> underrated. Just like, I think it's good to think about the experiences that we have, but with relationships, it's such more, such much more of such a, like an emotional investment. And it's such more of like a, a, a time spent with another person that if you have experiences, which are similar, in terms of relationship, I feel like that's very compelling evidence. Like <laughs> that, you know, because because it is, it's a clash of an autistic and an holist, holistic person, and and living in and you know, so that those differences are obviously going to show up a lot more. Mm -hmm. So I think def definitely, I can I can see why. I, I am aware that we've been chatting for a while and we've we've only kind of gone with the, the first question that I was going to ask. I think it would be really good to have you back on at another point to talk about perhaps the, the, the more dating side of things. Okay, anytime. And sort of how to, I guess, uh, the, the, the more kind of finding a partner and, and, and sort of the, like, the early stages of things, if that, that would be okay. Absolutely. But I'd I'd love to talk a, a little bit about kind of the the, the challenges um, or the positives to neurodivergent relationships, uh, but also about like life milestones, mm. things like moving in together, holidays, mm -hmm. as you, as you mentioned a little bit about uh, mm -hmm. getting married, mm -hmm. engagements, what that means, mm -hmm. what what it you know, all of that stuff. Yeah, I kind of. Started off phrasing it as a question, and, and now it's not. But do you get do you but, get what I'm asking? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I think there are major milestones that occur as your relationship moves on, right? So the first one mm. might be that you're monogamous, or that you're dating only each other, or you're dating maybe two people, or whatever, right? There, there's something happening that you're more committed to each other. And so being clear about what that looks like, because one person, <laughs> I remember my ex saying, um, because you thought about cheating during our marriage, as far as I'm concerned, you cheated. I didn't understand that logic. Really? 
Yeah, I didn't understand that logic. But then I had one of my... It's a natural thing that people have curiosity about. It's (laughs) nothing that you can stop. It's just about not doing it like <laughs> right right but but you know what was so interesting thomas one of my autistic co-hosts when i shared that with her she says i understand where he was coming from because it hurt him just as much to know that i was thinking about cheating or at least this is what she thought as if i had done it it was like for him there wasn't a differentiation And so I think being clear about what monogamy means, if you're in a relationship with somebody who is um, a different neurotype, because is monogamy that you can't sleep with anybody else, like have sex with anybody else, or that you can kiss other people, right? So so being clear about what the definition boundaries. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's well, as I a, said, it's a, it's like a contract, isn't it? It's like which <laughs> which you know, with two right? adults consenting to a relationship, you don't have to follow all of the things that the mainstream is telling you that you need to do. Just exactly. you just need to both be agreeing to it, right? Because then the the guy I fell in love with after my divorce, he said to me he didn't consider cheating unless he slept with the person. So kissing somebody, right. going out on dates wasn't cheating. Okay. We need to understand that, right? <laughs> right? So that that's a first milestone that could literally break the relationship, right? You cheated on me. No, I didn't, you, right? Oh, did I hit it there? You bring up like a, an experience that I've had. Okay. Well, no, I, I've, I've never cheated on anyone or anything like that, but I have been in a lot of situations where I didn't understand that the situation was a date or it was something akin to a date or the the conversations that we're having were akin to not not a conversation with a friend and that's because I didn't really understand the the greater social context of what of what was happening and it, it goes so far even with flirting you know you know I, I don't really and and to be honest it is a very not a misunderstood idea that that flirting is just very easily characterizable it is to a certain extent it's very explicit when you are making like sexual references and and things of that nature but for for, for the majority of of situations sometimes for some people just having an interest and 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 talking to someone or if still talking to someone if they put their hand on your shoulder and you know, perhaps like tap your leg or like, you know, so it's very gray, that area. And I think that that there has been times in my life where I've understood my relationship with someone as a friend, but then, you know, it, looking back, it didn't really seem like that, that was how that went, but I didn't, flirt with them i didn't confess my love i didn't kiss them i didn't do anything um but the, you know i i did go and have a drink with them or something like a you know very much on their side it might the person that i went for a drink with they might be like oh this this is a date that that's happening <laughs> but it but it's not in my head and i'm like right i'm, I'm not going for a date. i'm going for a drink with a friend and you know it's not really understanding the other person's yeah. intentions with me. Yeah. So sometimes I think it's it's best just to ask, you know, is this a date or are we just going as friends? In that particular situation, if you're going out with somebody that you could potentially be in a relationship with. I was right? very young. I was okay. very young. I was like, <laughs> so well, one time, age of 14, <laughs> one time, <laughs> so the age of, yeah. <laughs> age of 18, 19. So. I get you. I got you. I got you. Yeah. My ex talked about those kind of situations in middle school too, where these girls had crutches on him and he didn't know and he didn't know what to do. And yeah. And he looks back and it just, when you see it through a different lens, you're like, oh my gosh, I could have had that girl or whatever. So I think oh, yeah. That- Understanding flirting is, is elusive. <laughs> like, it's really hard. In, in a dating context, but also. Yeah, I think it's hard for, yeah, for yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. Because so it's think individual, that, isn't it, to the person as well, isn't it? Because it's not like yes. this easily yes. understood concept. 
No, <laughs> there, there's no playbook. There's no, you know, dictionary or encyclopedia of different ways to flirt because everybody does it differently, right? Yeah, uh, sure. I think that that's hard for a lot of people. 